another week of O-Ship. This week, I've actually got Todd Kaplan, the CMO of Pepsi, joining us. Uh, Todd is someone who's worked across so many parts of Pepsi and their incredibly wide variety of global brands since he joined the company in two, 2006. So he has a lot of different experiences accumulated throughout his career. I was lucky enough uh, to get introduced to him just recently, so we're going to invite him on the show. He's got just a really, really cool background. He was actually once named Business Insider's top 25 most innovative CMOs in the world. Anyway, I was completely culturally obsessed. He's a massive marketing nerd. And I even recently discovered that he's a diehard Lakers fanatic. Now, I just want to be super clear. I said Lakers fanatic, not Laker fanatic. So this isn't going to get quite as weird, at least in that kind of way today. Uh, Pepsi and Todd personally are, are well known for using cultural moments to attract, attract consumer attentions. Today, we're going to dig into many of the aspects of Todd's career, but I'm particularly interested to hear how Todd's take on kind of capturing cultural moments to build lasting brands and subsequently great businesses. So I hope you are too. And here we go with another week of O-Ship. Todd, welcome to Ship. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I've really, really been looking forward to having you join us today. So it should, should make for a great show. And I appreciate you uh, finding uh, a couple minutes to chat with us. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I, you know, I heard you uh, had a, an interesting year at the Cannes Lions this year. So uh, great. Congrats on, on your guys' wins there. Uh, we, did you make it, uh, so you make it in person, I assume? Yeah, no, I was out there. Um, it was a it was a few weeks ago now, but yeah, I was out there in Cannes, and it was great just being back uh, in real life this year, uh, and just connecting with old industry friends. And uh, yeah. there's actually a, a juror this year too, which was an interesting. Oh, experience. awesome! How, how many years did you take it off out of interest since the last visit? Um, uh, two years off. So obviously yeah. the the core of the pandemic, and then last year they still didn't uh, run it back, and so it was virtual. Yeah. Uh, the previous year. That's yeah. awesome. I, I knew uh, a bunch of our crew were out there and I, I didn't make it this year, but I, 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 I feel like um, the event is changing in, in, a, in a pretty interesting way. I'd love to, I'd love to get your take on like how you feel like it's changed over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I love Cannes and it's, it's great not just being in Cannes and yes, of course, what would you yeah. not love about being in the South of France with a glass of rosé and, yeah. you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I would say, um, Aside from the environment, just the idea of just everybody coming together to celebrate creativity at its best and yeah. what it can do to really move culture in the world forward is, is really the essence of what the Can Lions are all about. And um, it's been interesting because I'd say if you look over time, it started off as really just where the creative industry, the agencies, all the people would get together to celebrate great work. And then I think in the early 2000s, um, P&G was one of the first brands, but I think brands started to really come out and attend as well. And then because all the brands started to attend, then all the media partners yeah. attend because all the the key decision makers and all that are there. And then now it's just like, it's a party. It's it's kind of, uh, it's leveled up like 50 times where everyone's got, you know, uh, a yacht, a thing, an experience, yeah, yeah. a speaker, a performance. So it's, it's there's a lot going on, but it's, what I like doing most is just really um, geeking out on some of the great work, yeah. reconnecting with old friends and and all that. Yeah, I, uh, one of the things that caught my eye this year that I thought was, was pretty neat, for the record, I went, I think, 10, 10 straight years, but I haven't been in, in a couple of years. And for those of you watching or listening to those ship show right now, uh, if you're not familiar with the Cam Lions, they're kind of like, for years, they were kind of known as like the, the Oscars of the advertising industry. Uh, but like any event, you know, they got uh, a bit walloped uh, by the pandemic over the last couple of years. But I, I noticed there's like this, uh, such a higher degree of focus on, uh, it seems like innovation and like, customer experience and, and these things yeah. that almost don't feel like advertising, uh, which is, uh, I think is really cool, frankly. Yeah. Um, what's, what's great about it too, is they're very, um, I mean, there's been a lot of real purpose driven <clears throat> work that's been, been here in recent years, but I think the majority of the work that wins isn't like an ad, right? It's usually yeah. an idea or, a, a you know, something a little bit more, more, uh, holistic than just a, a TV commercial or something like that. Yeah. So. Well, uh, I have to, you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is uh, leaning into this idea of, you know, these, these cultural moments that you like to get associated with. And I thought that could maybe a really neat way of doing that before uh, talking about the big theoretical side of this and, and, and how, you know, broader strategies, but just 
really showing people what this really means. And uh, this year, you guys, as I mentioned earlier, had won some really great awards for a really, really um, outstanding campaign uh, called Better With Pepsi. Uh, I actually pulled uh, a, a video of God that kind of explains some of it. And, and I'd love to just, um, you know, kind of pull, pull this as a, like a background mood video while, while we're talking. Um, and uh, if you can cue up the play button on that, it would be great for me. Um, but this kind of just shows some of the work there. But I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about around what um, Better With uh, Pepsi was. Yeah, sure. Um, so it really started everything uh, we do on our team. We always start with a real consumer truth or insight or a cultural insight uh, as well. And, you know, it's one of those things that one of the biggest um, things we need to do on brand Pepsi is drive association in those moments where our brand matters most. So with food is one of those things. And hamburgers are one of the number one foods that go well uh, with Pepsi. And actually we tested it and you can see here, 60% of people actually prefer uh, their burgers with a Pepsi, which is a great insight. But then there's this cultural insight that all the top burger chains in the US actually don't pour Pepsi, they pour Coke. And so there's this real creative tension there around McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's um, not serving the optimal way to enjoy a burger, which is with a Pepsi. And so we found this really clever way, which you can see here, uh, to put our find our Pepsi logo within the logos of all the other uh, major burger chains. Uh, and so we called it Better with Pepsi. And there was a whole art to the craftsmanship behind this That's thing so because cool. – um, you know, legally we couldn't manipulate anything. So we hired an origami artist, as you saw there, who folded the wrapper yeah. to kind of find it there. We put this idea of better with Pepsi, you know, in front of all their stores and out in the world and uh, had a lot of fun with it on social as well. And the thing just went bananas and it was, uh, was a whole lot of fun and really just a great way, again, to celebrate a product truth about our brand, which is that, you know, burgers taste great with us. And then also a, a cultural truth um, you know, around the fact that um, these these brands uh, hadn't really enjoyed our product with theirs as well. Um, yeah. we, I, we, I, I love I love basically the all the other ways people are finding it. I went and searched a bunch of this uh, you know, uh, in the last couple of days. Just so so slick. Um, you know, it's like it's like once you see it, you can't unsee can't it. Un and I feel it. Like it's people totally are became <laughs> like you know meme culture and everybody. Yeah, we flipped some of their big burger chains to to Pepsi as well. But yeah, once you once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that's the idea. We had this really fun line of we're not on the menu, but we're always in the picture. You know, like I love it's it. A, yeah. Really, know, really, so it was, really it was cool. a lot of fun. And we won uh we won a bunch we won two gold lions, a silver, a bronze, uh, a whole bunch with that, which was uh, you know, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, well deserved. So uh, you know, I think this is a great, a great segue. Uh, you know, we, we kind of talking about um cultural moments. So how do you feel like this campaign uh, captured a, a cultural moment specifically? Yeah, well, I feel like um, it's and it's not that this was like a cultural moment in itself, because cultural moments, you know, it's a pretty lofty thing to say something's a cultural moment. Mm -hmm. But I think culture in general is something I think that's really important to me as a marketer and really important to us as a brand like uh, mm -hmm. like Pepsi, because I think it's um, it's how the brands are received within the world. Right. Like I think mm -hmm. a lot of advertisers, marketers, whatever they want to call themselves build a lot of programs and a lot of campaigns and a lot of stuff that it might achieve an objective they have, but it doesn't really land. It's still bucketed as, as an ad or as a piece of marketing material. And so something that resonates in culture is something you connect with, you know, when we do the Pepsi Super Bowl halftime show with, with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Eminem, everyone was talking about it. 70, you know, 2% of all people uh, talking about brands on the Super Bowl, we're talking about Pepsi, you know, like it's a, so that's a cultural moment that you really galvanize. So I have this philosophy with my team, I like to call uh, being culture in versus brand out. And the, the real premise starts with that a lot of marketers really have what I think like blinders on where they really just start and say, get this person to do this by these rational things and then communicate it out. And that's fine. But we really start our process by listening to culture, what's happening out there and figuring out little ways where we can connect. So in that, that burger example uh, we were just talking about with Better With Pepsi um, is really this idea of there's this cultural truth out there that every burger chain, the big, all big three, you know, pour uh, Coca-Cola. And then there's this product truth that really competes with it that we taste better. And so that's where we start the tension in the brief. 
rather than just start to pound our chest and be like, hey, everybody, Pepsi tastes better. Go try it. You know, and so it's a little subtle nuance, but it really inspires different thinking and ideas. And when you, when you start thinking about, I mean, even the teams, the agencies, like, to, like, you know, to think in this kind of way, is, is it something that's taught or do you think it's something that you, you really have to find people that live and breathe this every day? Yeah, it's um, you got to break stuff <laughs> to do it a little bit. You know, it's a lot of the age old agency model, I think, as we all know, is is needs to evolve significantly. And I've been a big mm. proponent of that. I think um, think of it this way. I think the pandemic shined a huge light on it when everyone was scrambling to figure out what the hell to do. But when you think of a typical the formality that comes along with agency client dynamics, here's the mm. briefing. Here's round one, round two. I'm selling you. I'm buying this. I'm going back and refining it. The people wait and it's like a five month process by the time mm-hmm. you produce something from when you first started off. And yeah. in that amount of time, culture has already changed 50 times, you know, like, you know, the world is at war or something else happens mm-hmm. or there's a, a big event that, you know, so the cultural context um, matters more than ever today. And I think context is the one thing that you can't plan for, you know, and there's also, and so you need to be more agile. So I've started this new process, you know, we call it collaborativity, uh, where we really mm-hmm. partner deeper with our agencies. And, um, you know, this thing where we call it round zero, where we come together and just mm-hmm. I have them come with like literally one line idea nuggets. Don't come out with a 20 page script that you're going to read to me. And I know we're not into it or whatever, like mm-hmm. just the idea. And let's tease out mm-hmm. to get the right territories mm-hmm. first and align before you get into executions and mm-hmm. a whole bunch of stuff like that we do. But it, um, I think it's, it's cool. important. Yeah, to be more of like thought partners rather than uh, agency and client, you know. Getting, uh, yeah, I want to go back to that in a minute. Uh, I want to, a couple more questions on the, on the on the cultural side of things. So yeah. I can't help but feel like uh, when you align yourself to you know, with your co- co- cultural context a second ago, um, that there is maybe a higher level of risk there for a brand, but also simultaneously a higher level of payoff when you nail it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so any, any kind of reaction, is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think it's, um, what I'm not trying to say is just go like a leaf in the wind, wherever culture goes, you get like, that's not a winning strategy either. Yeah, yeah. Do this strategy successfully. It starts with really knowing who you are as a brand. You have to have healthy self-awareness as a brand and say, we are about this. We are not about this. So these sort of things that are happening have nothing to do with our brand. And so it's really about where those cultural insights connect with your brand insights and really meet, right? Mm-hmm. And so is your brand point of view and how that really comes about to take those cultural insights and bring a mm-hmm. unique take on how your mm-hmm. brand is adding value to those discussions mm-hmm. rather than just, oh, look, we signed so-and-so too, or we can, you know, tweet this as well. You know, that that's not that uh, mm-hmm. exciting. And so it's really bringing that point of view to it. Mm-hmm. And, and when you, if you were to give this advice to other people who, uh, you know, want to think about their own brand in this context, is this... Uh, you know, kind of a short, uh, so, so they think about it a short term view or more of a long term view? I think it's um, in the long term, the most important thing is to really understand who your brand is and what you stand for, you know, back to like mm. almost like the Simon Sinek, you know, why do you exist kind yeah. of stuff, right? Um, and what's your real sh- distinctive point of view uh, that you have as your brand? And then understand all that and how it manifests. And then as you find little cultural truths, it's really about extracting the insight so that you can create that kind of rich tension between there's something, you know, an example for Pepsi, I would say when the pandemic happened and um, our brand right now is about um, unapologetic enjoyment is kind of our point of view of like, well, there's an insight about Pepsi drinkers that they love to enjoy these little moments of life a little bit, they're a little bit extra, right? And so they'll, um, clap at the end of the movie, they'll go karaokeing, they'll, um, you know, dress up head to toe in sporting gear at an event, they'll dance at a concert, you know, all that kind of stuff, a little bit more than most people, even if they're judged, they don't really care. And so when the pandemic hit and football, for example, was taken away and fans couldn't go to the stadiums and there's this insight, a cultural insight about these people who would go to tailgates every single week and they'd go with their family and their friends and it was a whole thing and that was taken away from them. And so for somebody who unapologetically enjoys football, we brought a New York Jets fan. We built the New York Jets parking lot on their front 
lawn and brought built an end zone, brought in the parking booth, awesome. literally all of it, and painted the end zone there and gave them their tailgate on their front lawn. And now their yeah. neighbors probably hate it, but it's unapologetically, hey, we enjoy football so much, I'm going to screw up my house and do all this. But that's just one like little small thing, for example. So it's how you take an insight and bring your brand point of view into it to create something interesting. How, how, you know, I, I heard uh, I heard you say someplace that you uh, hate hate the word advertising, and I feel <laughs> like you know, and I, and I feel like when you like I feel these moments you're trying to create, and I feel a little bit of that advertising there, but there's something else. So why is that accurate? Do you, do you hate the word advertising? So I do. Cool. It um it's super old school, man. Like it takes me yeah. to um this Mad Men you know sort of vibe. Totally with you. Adver- yeah. And and the. The concept is this, is that the world used to be very 2D, right? Everyone yeah. would gather around and watch TV and watch the show and you would interrupt them and the, they had to watch the, the advertising because that was the only show in town and you couldn't skip and all that kind of stuff. And it was a one way, hey, we're going to go get you consumer as a big company to go get you to buy this or tell you this and whatever, whether you want to hear it or not. I think you fast forward to today where... Not only do you have the internet, not only do you have mobile, now you have all these other kind of things and dynamics and platforms to engage, but it's a two-way dialogue. And um, there's also a lot of ways to skip ads. And it really starts from this fundamental concept. And this is, again, I'm big on common sense. And so think of your own life. Think of your own life. It's a good right? So think of your think of your own life, Freddie, and how much time you spend Um you're watching TV, you're streaming, you're texting people, you're reading media articles from the news, you're watching a movie, you're you know on TikTok, whatever you're doing. What percent of that time are you watching or engaging with paid advertising or paid media? And it's probably like maybe 10%. And when you are, you're probably leaned out or skipping or doing something else. Yeah. However, on the other side, as a marketer, that's all our industry talks about and focuses on. We have people at our company that spend all day working on ad campaigns and doing stuff and the media partners selling, I got to sell you this, here's the CPM, here's who we reach. And it's like, listen, you're reaching them in this very narrow lane, which is great. And there's a role for that to be clear. But that whole other white space, which is really about PR, earned media, social media, um, real cultural things. If you're texting your friends and family something cool you saw, that's real. That's, you know, engaging. I'm reading an article on CNN covered some story or uh, I'm seeing it organically trending on Twitter. That's like, then it happened. You know, I use this expression with my team. I say, if a um, tree fell in the woods and no one heard it, did it happen? And I feel like a lot of marketing doesn't happen. Uh, and by that, I mean, in terms of culture. And so we aspire to do things that happen as in people talked about and, you know, and all that. So I, I want to go back to the creative process that brings these, these ads to life. So this creative, I should call creative, creative body of work. Um, yeah, yeah. I use the term, I'll make sure I'm repeating it, but collaborativity. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really cool. So uh, I love this. that You said that a lot of the ideas are presented just like, look, don't make mock-ups. Like just give me, pitch it to me in a couple sentences kind of thing. It actually reminds me of uh, some of the early days of my, my old agency, I can Knowing group. And we used to, we just literally have like, we'd call clients up and we'd have 20 ideas and we'd just be a word doc. We wouldn't even send them a deck and we just, yep. we just rough pitched the ideas. I loved it. I think it was some of the most fun creative work I ever did in my career was at that point. But you guys are, you know, have a tremendous scale, a lot of different partners, you know, a yep. crazy amount. How, how many brands does Pepsi have now in total? I mean, well, PepsiCo has, I mean, it's it's a ton. Right? Crazy, a lot. A lot. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous, yeah. It's like, it's like for not knowing your wife's birthday, I really put you on the <laughs> spot there. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, with, you know, with, with that, I mean, again, I get the idea of the idea is being simple, but I'm intrigued. Is there any technology that's facilitating that as well? Is it like any specific systems or is it more about like a mindset and set of it's, processes? It's done, I'll be honest. It's a, it's a little messy, right? And it's, yeah, it's yeah. creativity is iterative by nature and it's, yeah. it's kind of a little bit massaging. It's like kneading dough a little bit is kind of, I'd yeah, say yeah. the process, right? And so, and it really starts with how, you know, the interesting part is this whole industry is based by people, Like right? We don't create yeah. widgets or factories. It's like yeah. 
people's brains getting together to come up with stuff, right? No agency yeah. has a secret formula. It's like the people. And so it's how those people choose to interact with each other. And at the end of the day, um, there's a lot. And I think a lot of these holding companies have made the world very transactional where it's like, you got to sell, you got to grow this about business. You got to get, sell them on this idea, you know? And so it becomes selling and pitching rather than building and collaborating. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, we try to start with, Hey, we're not agency and client. We're co-conspirators. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we respect each other, no matter what level, what role, what mm -hmm. function let's mm -hmm. start before you get into like pitching a very baked idea that I got to sit through 30 minutes of stuff that I know is not going to get there. Because sometimes what also happens, frankly, in the process is you have a killer idea, but a real shitty execution. Or you have a bad idea, but something brilliant is in the execution. I love mm -hmm. this celebrity, how you took him to this or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have to throw out all of it because it's all muddled together. And so yeah. let's start almost at like the green lighting phase, where it's the yeah. one-liners. We'll get group text yeah. chains going and yeah. we'll just massage it and work it a little bit and then so you know what here's the thing let's bring the broader team in and come up with three executions around the idea that we like and that's some real merit to breaking things down to their like real base elements almost a little bit uh, a little bit yeah, yeah. so i, I want to jump uh, jump gears for a second um so one of the things as i was preparing for uh our interview today is i was really you know, pouring back over your your career and what really caught my eye was that you had worked so many different roles within within Pepsi. Like, you know, you had been uh, in the innovation side of the business. You had sure. been in the, you know, uh, you know, new new product uh, building. I mean, you you ran the I think it was it was a water the water portfolio. Water, right? Yeah, I created a couple brands: uh, bubbly sparkling water and uh, life cool. uh, new brands. Yes. Oh yes, I mean, so you, I mean, you really you know you run you run the gamut there. So when you think about this really broad range of work before you kind of, you know, even as you got up to sit in the kind of the big, the big chair, so to speak, yeah. what's, what's a couple of the most important things you've learned about, about building brands along the way? I think it's really, you know, I'm painfully consistent in all the different things that we've done. And it really starts with being consumer led. Um, and I know that's easier said than done, but a lot of times at big companies, there's pressures to do when I was on the water business, for example, you know, we hadn't figured out what we wanted to do in water. And that was a category that was really going gangbusters, growing, you know, sparkling water, premium water, alkaline water. There's so many things going on out there, coconut water. And everyone's like, what should we do? We had Aquafina. And um, there's a lot of points of views when there's either a big opportunity or a big issue in a business. And a lot of times um, what leaders or people are tempted to do is chase something that, for the wrong reason. And so, hey, uh, Walmart told us we should really consider buying this company or, hey, you should, you know, a senior leader said, go, we, we should be in this business or whatever. And that's not a reason to do it. You really need to start it, um, you know, from a consumer insight. And so that was really what was a game changer when I went over to water is to really start from, well, why do people drink water? And there's five reasons in this segmentation. And here's the real insight around why with premium water, it was that they like to carry it around with them in these big one liters. And so we started from the label in is how we built life water, which is, has mm -hmm. art you know, from emerging yeah. artists on the label and really pops and looks different, you know, bubbly. It was people wanted the fun of a soda, but the permissibility of a sparkling water and everything in sparkling water was pretty boring and purity based and all this other stuff. And so we brought the tabs that say, Hey you and hi, and all these kind of fun things. So, um, you know, we, it's really about starting from a consumer first lens, no matter what role you're in. And I think um, you really can't go wrong because you're, you're being led for the right reasons. Sure. And, you know, I just want to quickly thank, thank you for the tone. And I want to acknowledge there's some great people in, in the uh, watching who are live and are commenting. Uh, so if you have any thoughts you want to share, feel free to throw them in the chat. If you have any specific questions for Todd you'd like us to ask, if, if it makes sense, we'll, we'll throw it in the conversation. But we appreciate the engagement. And, and uh, again, thank you uh, for, for tuning in. Um, what, what's, you know, jumping back to where you were a second ago, Todd, um, uh, you know, again, you, you've kind of worked at all these different scales of the, uh, the business. You've had some really big responsibilities in terms of, um, you know, serious business units that fell under your uh, purview. Um, you know, when you think about your career, uh, 
what what I guess has been more exciting for you? Is it built? Is it the business building side? Or do you do you miss kind of being closer down to the work sometimes? You know, where, kind of, how does that play out for you? It's really funny, and it's it's so funny too because um, I've been at a, at PepsiCo for a long time, and it's like, oh well, aren't you? It's like, but every role is so different, and it's because we have such a broad portfolio, and so. That example I was giving you on the water business was really entrepreneurial and very much I'm starting new brands from scratch and figuring out how through the um, the VC of PepsiCo almost as the funder and the way to launch it, selling everyone internally on how and why and how to design it and build it and with R&D and all that stuff. Then on Pepsi, I'm coming into this storied iconic brand that needs a, a kick in the tires because it kind of lost its way a little and really needs to reinvigorate and reconnect with culture and so um for me i'm i'm usually just fulfilled as long as i'm challenged and as long as um you know there's a a lot of you know areas to kind of figure out how to fix and and improve uh, i really love this idea when i was in food service we we did a lot of building in this innovation role where i was creating a craft soda brand and and starting you know these really you know mixology and playing with i mean there's there's all sorts of fun stuff we've done so it's been great, I think, to just get a broad range. But obviously, I love the uh, creative elements of the work. There's obviously the whole business driving piece of it, meeting with customers and, yeah. you know, and going through our scorecards. And I can do all that as well. But it, um, I definitely like, you know, dreaming big and, and doing a lot of yeah. fun things. That I can feel it. That's, that's awesome. So I, I'm going to flip flip gears for a second. Uh, as you know, it would not be O-Ship if I didn't ask you for an O-Ship uh, uh, story. <laughs> Uh, there's no way a guy who's been doing it as long as you have hasn't got at least one that I'm hoping you're uh, willing, to, to willing to share with us. But I'd love to hear, you know, for those of you who may be tuning into OSHIP for the first time today, you know, we love to ask leaders about these moments that um, maybe something went wrong for them. It doesn't have to be horribly wrong, but something where it kind of an, o, an OSHIP moment, if you will. And, and sometimes the response is maybe it was not funny at the time, but it's funny now, and maybe it didn't learn anything, but it makes for a great story. Sometimes it could be something that maybe changed the way you think about being a leader. It, it, the floor is open to you, but I'd love, I'd love to hear what you. I got. mean, yeah, I have O oh ship moments every day. Uh, <laughs> just clear. Um, although I don't use the word ship, uh, the, we're um, a family show here, Todd. I don't want to hear any your filthy I language know, around I here. Know. I know. Uh, uh, but listen, I think um, there's a bunch of there's a, a whole bunch of examples I'm sure that you know that can come to mind. You know, some of them are more circumstantial things that like even with the best laid plans, something you know goes wrong, and then others are like, "Hey, we did something really well, and um, it didn't." But then uh, culturally, something blows up around it, and you know. And so I got a couple examples I can go very high level. Yeah, um, go for it. You know, one is more uh, more recently, a few years ago at the Super Bowl. Uh, and when it was in Miami, this was uh, the year we had the J-Lo and Shakira halftime yeah. show. But the Saturday before, we had a party. We wanted to get this big Pepsi, Pepsi party at the Super Bowl. It was for Pepsi Zero Sugar. It was a big priority for us. We had decided to do this new model where we were going to actually create and run the party ourselves. It was a beautiful venue we got. Um, it was on this like little island off the coast of uh, Miami, like like literally just like this small area that we built an entire, you know, um, concert venue kind of thing with for it. And we had um, Lizzo and Harry Styles were going to be performing. Awesome. And, I mean, that sounds amazing, right? Like yeah, Super Bowl, yeah. Pep, like, let's go. And it, so place looked amazing. It's beautiful. Everyone's there. All our executives are there. All the celebrities. It's fit. We were selling tickets for it. So it was a sold ticket. So it was packed. All these people dressed to the nines. Lizzo performs. The set, great. Before Harry Styles goes on, we get this sign comes on the um, the jumbotron kind of little thing, and it says, um, "You know, hurricane warning." And we're like, what? <laughs> what? "Normally, you get a little bit more warning than that." Just like, worth what the hell is that a hurricane warning? I'm like, is someone like is this a joke? And I guess there was like a tropical storm, um, literally that was coming through Miami for like, you know how they get these like 15 minute, just crazy rain. And then it like goes away. We had that. And, but because it was a temporary venue that we had built and it was very stable and sturdy and all that, but because of the ordinance and the coding and all that, they said, um, we had to evacuate and end the concert. (laughs) Oh my God. Everybody in the main act hadn't come on. Lizzo was the opener and it was just like, 
everyone, this was their Super Bowl Saturday night, and it was on an island, like, that literally had this bridge, like, it was a real pain in the ass to get to. <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to imagine all these people flooding over some they, bridge. They tell everybody to evacuate. Everyone's like, what the hell? Everyone's cursing. We're just like, holy crap, what are we going to do? And we're all on this bus kind of game planning, figuring out what are we posting on Twitter? How are we helping people? Who are we, you know, and I'm watching people literally in like waist deep water with their like boots in their beautiful Super Bowl thing, just cursing Pepsi as they're walking away. And <laughs> Damn you, Pepsi! And there's, of course, these like hardcore Harry Styles fans who were like, I paid for the sake and I like it. I felt horrible. And there's nothing you could do other than like, Hey, we're gonna. So, I mean, we ended up. I, I, I have to be honest. I can't imagine. Like, 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 yeah, yeah. It was bad. I, 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 for some reason, I envision hardcore Harry Styles fans all having really great hair, and people <laughs> with great hair, they don't want to be messing around with this rain stuff. I'm not like me. I mean, I sit out there and I'm asking it. Yeah, and it's one of those <laughs> things. Like, yeah, exactly. And it's like people, <laughs> people came to this place. It was an awesome venue, but it's just. This kind of you can't control these things, right? And this yeah, was like, yeah. and the irony was like, after the 15 minutes of just torrential downpour, it was like perfectly fine. And by the way, the roof stayed on and nothing was wrong with the building, but it was just like the fire marshal kind of a uh, situation. So um, that really sucked. That was definitely an oh ship moment. Um, and I think the learning is basically, hey, even with the best laid plans, you know, something is going to go wrong. And roll, a lot right? of times, it's beyond your control. You got to figure it out. It was very shitty at that time and very stressful and very a lot, but you got to quickly move and then you kind of move forward and move on and, you know, and you can't prevent all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but that was just uh, not a great one. <laughs> I, I uh, appreciate you sharing that one. It's always cool when you get to mix a, a fun, uh, fun celebrity in it or, uh, once yeah. or twice. So. Uh, I, uh, I, I, whenever I think of uh, favorite Super Bowl uh, performances ever with Volvo Rain, I always think of that Prince one, which I think was that oh, was you guys too, wasn't it? Yeah, that was one of our oh, very, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Harry Styles, someone... I felt horrible because he couldn't perform, and he like people came yeah. there to see him. Anyhow, so uh, awesome. Uh, well, I appreciate you, appreciate you sharing that one with us. Yeah. Hey, so I, I want to um, ch change gears for for a second. Um, one of the things I think is is really interesting about some of the you know some of the ways that you guys do branding is when when you think about cultural band, brands i think there's this it's what i'm looking for it's like it's like you want to be like a a loved brand right so this is i think there's a difference between being like a, a you know the value of being yeah. a liked brand versus being a loved brand and that and for and you know i work with a lot of guys in private equity in the investment world who are very um, uh, tangible, they like you know, very kind of clear financial results. You put five dollars in, you get ten dollars yeah. out. Kind of thinking. H how do you um, communicate the the power of the intangible that I yeah. think is a lot of like what your guys' marketing does? It's clearly effective for you, but I'd love to see how you talk to people about that. Yeah, I it's it's really funny you mentioned that because I I use with, with my team I call it the uh, the tattoo test. Um, people tattoo brands they love on their body. I mean, there are people with Apple tattoos, Nike, tat Harley Davidson, right? You think of that, like these iconic brands where it's not just a product, it's a brand, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. That That's the idea of brand building is that yeah. this little logo, this concept is what people are connecting to. It's a yeah. community, right? And so um, the idea of it, now listen, it doesn't always transactionally apply to, therefore it's more sales or loyalty, you know, fierce loyalty. It's like even people who, you know, I have a Bonvoy account with the Marriott properties or I have a, you know, a, a travel loyalty card with an airline or whatever. Guess what? I stay at other hotels and I travel in other airlines as well, but I prefer to get points and do things. Now, those are a little bit more transactional in terms of how yeah. they get loyalty because it's almost like bot loyalty, but real brand love. Um, organically are the people who are going to be at the front seat of the row when you're doing something, you know? So those are the people who, when we do these little things, I call culture bombs, these little um, product drops. I'm a big sneakerhead, head, uh, Freddie. So whenever yeah, I yeah. took awesome. from the, the sneaker book and we did like, you know, Pepsi peeps and, you know, and uh, maple syrup, Pepsi and all these little things. These are people who are just huge Pepsi fans. Like I have to get it. They're buying it for a thousand dollars on eBay. They're reselling, you know, like, yeah. It's just those little moments just to show people you see them, you get them, and you're appreciative. And those are the people that really are the heartbeat uh, of any brand. I love that. 
so, so uh, spinning off of that, and you mentioned that you're a sneakerhead a second ago. Um, I want to talk about the idea of of aligning around cultural moments, but in a platform and something that's long term. And, and I'm going to give you an interesting example. I'll be interested to see if you remember it. I guess it would have been somewhere in the kind of mid 2000s. There was a site that Foot Locker, Foot Locker put out called Sneakerpedia. And they yeah. had this idea of being the Wikipedia of sneakers. And, oh, wow. and actually, and it, was, it was actually put out by Sapia Nitro when I was there. It was really, really, really cool. But they, they had a marketing mindset. They like launched it, they built it, they got all these people to use it. And because they were thinking about it like a campaign, when it, it ceased to fit the narrative of how they thought about advertising effectively, then they killed it. But mm. I think you know, this would have been a perfect example of saying, like, if I could have yeah. gone back in time, I should say, guys, you, this should be a forever strategy if it's working well, for you. It's, it's so right on because I think, again, and I don't work for Foot Locker. I don't know. Yeah, yeah again, we're s- said with, uh, as, as outsider's perspective. Yeah, but, yeah. but here's where as an outsider where I think it's like, I'm sure there's some creative tension. There's some tension probably in their building of get foot traffic into the stores, sell more shoes once they're in the stores. All, like Just normal, like drive the business. You want to sell more year over year. That's what any business wants to do. How you merchant is how you promote. When you think with that lens, that leads you to come the foot liker. We have the new Jordans for, you know, $79.99, you know, on special. Check it out and very transactional focused ad. When you talk about what you're talking about, which is there's a community of people who are obsessed with all things that are in your store. We'll spend (laughs) hours, go on the site, chat, make friendships out of it, do all of that and be thankful to you for hosting and creating that experience. That's in that. Those are the people who, by the way, yeah. are going to buy 12 pairs of sneakers at your store, not just the one or the. And so it is a little more short sighted. Now, again, I don't know the cost to maintain it and how you reconcile short term, yeah. long term, but it, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I think I just think it's just, you know, again, this idea like if you if so much of this is about kind of aligning yourself with the community, especially if they're a passionate one, like I think there's a, a mindset shift. I suspect could they go back in time? They probably wouldn't have done that. But at the time, it just wasn't you know, how a bigger, some of these bigger companies think about things. Another one, great brand I saw do with that once was uh, uh, Wrigley. A friend of mine built this platform called Candy Stand for them. It was a huge okay. gaming portal, but I guess it, you know, they're like, hey, we're not in the software or the media business. So they, you know, it got really big and they, and then they sold it off to someone else. But again, I feel like, you know, it's so hard. It sounds like, um, based on what I've been hearing from you, it's, it feels like it's so hard to get into these cultural moments and cultural contexts and sit at the heart of these communities that yeah. I guess my, my, and I, I'm not certain I don't speak a few on this, but it, for me, it feels like I tell people like, Hey, if you actually nail it and you can do it authentically, hang out for as long as you can. <laughs> totally. No, and listen, and I, I get that every organization has different pressures. The role of marketing, is it, yeah. you know, a service to the thing or is it the center of where everyone's in service of the brands and, and so there's there's different lenses that drive a lot of those different things. But I, I couldn't agree with you more, man, that it's um, that is that is the way it needs to be done and, and how people should look to build their brands in over time. You know, oh, I think it's a great, great spot to, to wrap up this week. Uh, Todd, I want to make sure that people can find you if they uh, want to learn more about you or just follow your insights. Uh, yeah. So what, what are the best places that people should be thinking about you? Um, yeah, I think you can, uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I usually put a, a good amount of content out there and then also on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle I think is at underscore teacup. Oh, look at that. There you go. Follow on, <laughs> on it. Crew marketing team is on it. Awesome. Um, great. Well, uh, you certainly are a new follow for me and, uh, I hope lots of other people take the time, uh, to, to join you there. Th- thank you again for, for joining us today. For those of you, whether you're watching live or you're following, watching us afterwards on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or even listening on any of our audio podcasts across Spotify or, or uh, any of the other platforms, Apple, you know, Google Music, wherever, wherever Google Podcasts, wherever you're tuning into us, thank you so much for, for following. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And the best thing you can do to support the show is uh, basically – spread the word, tell a friend. So, um, Todd, thank you again uh, for joining us today. I really, really enjoyed the time with you. You were wonderful. And uh, see you next week, our shippers. Sounds great.